Let's do this. It's Hot Sheet by Baseball America. Scotty Braun, JJ Cooper, and Ben Badler starting off the show right from the jump. And you know, sometimes things just work out perfectly. It happens to be a day where there are multiple high-level call-ups, and we're excited about it. So first off, just encouraging everyone, if you have a question or a comment, we'll try and mix some of those in towards the end. If you don't subscribe to the Baseball America YouTube channel, go for it right now. Same with the website, go get yourself a subscription and same with the podcast page as well. We'll post this a little bit later on. So I want to jump right into it. A prospect profile on Jack Leiter making up to the show. Here we go. JJ Cooper, let's start with you. I know you've been following Jack Leiter for quite some time. He was a star in college. It took him a little bit of time, but that's okay. He's about to turn 24 years old in about a week and now we'll get to see him for the first time in the bigs with the Texas Rangers. What are you expecting? One thing I've got to give credit to, to Jack is, is coming out of college, it looked like he was just going to cruise to the majors. And actually, there's been a lot more adversity, a lot more struggles and, and difficulties than maybe would have been anticipated when he was the, the second pick in the 2021 draft. And he's kind of reassessed, adjusted, improved his delivery, and kind of bounce back to get to the big leagues. This is not a, uh, a pitcher who's had an easy path. He has a career ERA over five. He's had some times where he's really struggled with control. But since he spent that time last year on the developmental list in 2023, came back, slowed down delivery, simplified delivery, his control improved, his fastball, which has always been an excellent pitch when he could get ahead and counts, has become even better. You put it all together. Now here he is. He's going to make his... MLB debut and maybe, you know, has a chance to stick around, which is something that at this time last year seemed very far away. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I was all in on Jack later when the Rangers drafted him. And like JJ said, there, you know, wasn't a whole lot to be excited about over, over the last couple of years, but to see what he's done this year. And, and like JJ said, really going back to the very end of last year has been, uh, at least encouraging to see. I mean, I think number one, obviously, is just the the strikes, right? I mean, it's kind of obvious. He was walking 5.2 batters uh, per nine innings last year. This year, it's under two per nine. He was, you know, he's fallen behind in counts, and hitters were just able to sit on the fastball. And, and there's some good properties to the fastball, but, uh, you know, when he's not commanding it, uh, especially it's a, a very hittable pitch, and he made a lot of mistakes, and hitters made him pay for those mistakes. But, I think the other thing this year is the the slider too. We're seeing him throw it with a, a little bit more power this year, but he's also landing it for strikes 72% of the time, which obviously is up from where it was last year. So uh, I think you're seeing him throw the slider a little bit more frequently too, where, you know, he's not always behind in the count. one o two o three one counts where hitters are sitting on that fastball and just teeing off on that pitch. So, um, you know, it's it's only a few starts this year. I don't want to go overboard, but it's definitely encouraging to see some of the adjustments uh, look, looking like they're starting to pay off for him. What Ben said is something that really I think we should watch for as he goes to the majors. Before he was shut down, worked on his delivery, 59% strike percentage. After that, 64% strike percentage. That makes a big difference. But I kind of even going beyond throwing strikes, what I'm going to be very interested to see at the big league level is 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 he locating that fastball? Because if he's in the top third of the zone or above it, he gets a ton of swings and misses. He's got kind of that flat plane. He's got the carry on the fastball. He's got 97, 98, you know, when he needs it. You put all that together, and he's the kind of guy who, on a great night, can go out and strike out 10 and walk no one. And everyone, we're going to go, wow, just look at, you know, the Jack Leiter that we saw. in Oh, wait, hold on, JJ. Your, your mic's, we got a little issue. We'll come right back to you. Uh, give it one sec. Um, ben, I'll swing it back over to you while we have a moment. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, coming into the year, very low expectations just based on the last couple of years. And, you know, don't want to go overboard just on a few starts, uh, just based on the history that we've seen the last couple of years, but, um, I, you know, I thought coming out of the draft, this guy could be a frontline starter and don't really have those expectations right now, but he seems right now, like he could step in and potentially be a, a solid back of the rotation starter with, with some upside for more 
uh, if some of these adjustments are are for real and, and can stick around uh, throughout the course of the season. Hey, Ben, what have you thought about the Rangers' approach to drafting and developing pitchers lately? Obviously, you know, Kumar Rocker is another big name on that list. You know, there was controversy when he was first picked, doesn't end up signing with the Mets, and, you know, the Rangers end up taking him earlier than most people expected. So, you know, there were some names marinating in the minor leagues that people had been waiting for the last couple years. And in the meantime, they won a World Series. Yeah. And, you know, I think they've overhauled a lot of things in player development. And, and if you look back at the last, geez, decade of Rangers pitching development, um, it's pretty underwhelming. Uh, and then you see him trade Cole Reagans to the Royals and it's like, oh, all of a sudden he <laughs> looks looks outstanding. So, um, you know, it haven't been a lot of success stories for the Rangers uh, pitching development program, but uh, if he's able to, if, if Leiter is able to make these adjustments and it's able to stick and, and turn into real positive results in the big leagues, uh, that would be, a, I think, a huge step forward for them. And this is something where this will be one, a fun one to watch because Leiter will be, if, if he can stick, a development success story for, as yes, even though he was the number two pick of the draft, as we talked about, there's been a lot of work here. Um, I do think that the, the key thing that the uh, the Rangers have done a little bit better lately is they kept these guys healthy. Uh, that was, a, I think, a big problem. If you went back 1920, there was a whole lot of guys getting hurt. You got to keep these guys healthy. But at the same time, obviously, I'm also going to not nitpick too much when uh, they, they've had enough. You know, yes, they're, they've traded away some guys also. But if it's trading guys to help you win a World Series, well, then uh, then then it's quite OK to, to trade away it to Tako Roby and, and guys like that as well. Hey, JJ, this is probably a good problem to have, but the Rangers have quite a few pitchers on the injured list that could come back at some point later in the year. How do you project Jack Leiter on the short term? Like, let's say he performs well, but he's not like, you know, a one or a two and he's blown away the league. I mean, eventually there are a lot of arms coming back. And I'm not just talking about the DeGrom Scherzer, mm -hmm. you know, mix. It's Tyler Molly. And then even, you know, Corey Bradford, who just, or Cody Bradford, who just hit the aisle recently for the Texas Rangers, is supposed to be in the back end of their rotation and probably still has a spot when he comes back. But there, there could be some healthy competition here. Yeah, and I don't think, I think that you would look at that this is a little bit of kind of a bonus for Leiter that he's getting up so soon. I don't think if everything, if everyone's healthy, that he's the guy they want to have up there yet. Again, you want to see him do this a little bit more. He's been really good so far this year. He was really solid at the end of last season, but he's also not uh, dominating. He's dominating as far as strikeouts and walks, but he gives up a lot of homers. He's still giving up a lot of homers. Last outing out in the minors, he gave up three solo homers. I think if everyone's healthy, the Rangers would not have a problem with Jack Leiter kind of getting a chance to further refine in AAA and be more of a factor second half of the season than first. But – Hey, the, the situation has arose. He's ready to go enough to where they're comfortable going to him. And so he does have that chance to go out. And there is the potential to dominate in there that could make it really difficult for the Rangers to send them back down. The flip side of that, though, is, is that he is homer prone where one bad inning and all of a sudden he could be cruising for three or four. And all of a sudden it's a four run inning and you go, OK, well, what happened here? That's kind of the two sides of the coin with what Jack Leiter is right now. I'm looking at some comments right. here right now in the YouTube chat. Here's Angelo struggles build character. <laughs> yeah, that's true, Angelo. And hey, there's Carlos Colazzo, our buddy. Keep that fastball up, Jack. Like you mentioned, JJ, I mean, there's a massive difference here with the way that his fastball is playing up in the zone uh, versus down in the zone, right? Oh, it's when he's up in the zone at the or above the zone, it's a swing and miss fastball, which there aren't a whole lot of those in the big leagues. His is, has the ability to do that. But the difference is, is if he's middle zone, bottom of the zone, or even below the zone, then it's a fastball that hitters can tee off on. You're, you're talking about the difference between uh, turning every hitter into Aaron Judge if he's low in the zone or turning every hitter into uh, you know Nick Ahmed if he's at the top of the zone. Mm -hmm. There you go. So Jack Leiter, welcome to the show. We're excited to see how his big league debut goes and how he fits in with this Rangers rotation. Next up, 
prospect profile time on a call up from the Los Angeles Dodgers system that some people are very excited about and their fans had been calling for. They are impatient right now. And here comes 23 year old Andy Pajes. So let's go over Pajes and what he can bring to the table here. AJ, this is a Dodgers prospect who is a Cuban ball player with a ton of pop, has a big arm, that toolsy type of player that you expect to come out of Cuba. And Dodgers fans are not pleased with the results of the bottom half of their lineup. So will they potentially be a little bit happier, right? That's that's an understatement. Will they potentially be a little bit happier if they see Pajes doing what he's been doing in a short stint right now in the minor leagues uh, so far this season? Oh, a- absolutely, because this is a guy who can add a ton of pop to the of that lineup. He can play right, he can play left, he can play center, but you really don't want him out in center very often. But he does run pretty well, big arm. Uh, routes can you know get a little bit better out there, but he's still young. But the key thing is, is he's healthy. He missed most of last year with a shoulder injury, and, and that probably slowed his uh, arrival by you know at least a, a few months. But But we're talking about a guy here who... I know he's had a great, I mean, he had an incredible last week. He's very high on our prospect hot sheet over at baseballamerica.com this week. But on top of that, this is a guy who was also doing that all spring. Um, I, I happened to see him on the backfields and first pitch he saw in a game, home run. Later in the backfield, same game, home run. There's just big time pop here. There's a guy who also has a chance to hit for average and power. Um, I'm going to be interested to see if this is kind of a, a short term or more of a long term play. Obviously, what Pajes does is going to determine that in some ways, but Jason Hayward's hurt right now. Chris Taylor's not hitting, but this is still a very crowded Dodgers uh, roster because you obviously have a DH spot filled with Shohei Otani. You have, you know, Mookie Betts bouncing all around the field. You have, you, you have numerous players here, but Ben, the thing I'm kind of, I do think that Pajes is good enough, is talented enough and maybe is ready enough to, be a guy who takes this opportunity, grabs it, and doesn't let go of it. Yeah, and, and you talked about the, you know, he missed most of last year after having shoulder surgery. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think anybody questioned the, the power that Pahe's had before the injury, right? But like, okay, he just had shoulder surgery. Is it going to take a little bit while, a little bit of time for the power to come back? Well, no, <laughs> like that's clearly uh, nope. not an issue. And it just look at the track, the like kind of the history of his development to me has been really impressive because this was a guy I, I was pretty skeptical of him when he was a prospect coming up in the lower levels. Uh, he had a lot of tools, like you said, gigantic raw power, huge arm strength, pretty good athlete. But he, you know, the swing gets uphill. He had some holes. There was a lot of swing and miss that 2019 season when he was in the Pioneer League in rookie ball. He struck out 28 percent of the time and pretty much every year, every level. It's he's lowered that strikeout rate. It was twenty five percent the two seasons after that. Last season, you know, it was a shortened season, but twenty three percent. This year, again, only fifteen games, but it's an eighteen percent strikeout rate. So he's been able to make a lot of adjustments for, um, you know, for somebody who had a lot of a lot more holes in his swing and, and in his offensive game at the lower levels. Now he's he, you know, again, no question about the power and he's been able to make adjustments with some more efficiencies in his swing and improvements in an approach to be able to, uh, you know, make more contact, I think is going to be big, big for him. Yeah. Mixing in some comments here from the group, uh, Jeff from the BA squad, uh, good angles with enough power and walks. And as we're looking at these JJ, I'll cue you up with my next question for you. And here's uh, one eye dragon Pajes plays, uh, comps, anything that, Dodgers fans can look at with him and say, oh, this could this could be player X, you know, for us this season. Hmm, okay. I, I'm trying to think of one. Um, okay, this one's going to sound bad, but I'm going to say Alex Verdugo a little bit. Like, you know, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that as in corner outfielder who's kind of well-rounded. Pajas may have a little bit more power if it all comes together. But, um, again, a guy who is – I don't – the great thing about this Dodgers lineup, and I know it's struggled – Right now, it's struggling a little bit recently, but they're not going to have to ask him to be a star. They're asking for him to be the fifth, sixth, seventh best guy in the lineup. Um, and so I, I think he's very capable of handling that. 
And this is a guy, look, this is a hard lineup to break into. Uh, you know, you just look at guys who've been buried, guys who've been stuck, who haven't made it to the, uh, you know, to the, to the big leagues long-term with the Dodgers who have to get traded elsewhere, like a Michael Bush. Paez is the guy who has a chance to break through that because there is enough bat here. And he also kind of fills the positional need that maybe they have this year, and especially going forward. Okay. Um, anyone for you, Ben, stand out uh, on the comp yeah. side? Yeah, nobody that like really jumps to mind, but yeah, kind of like Jeff said, somebody who's going to uh, draw walks, somebody who can hit 25 plus home runs. Uh, you know, I don't, the strikeouts are still there. I don't think he's going to contend for a, a batting title, but, you know, maybe a league average to tick below uh, hitter, but with, you know, the walks to offset some of the strikeouts and then again, 25, maybe 30 plus type home run power if everything clicks. Mm hmm. And the thing to keep in mind with Dodgers prospects is that, yeah, sometimes you might kind of get buried. Um, but if you do get an opportunity to play and you're on a team that's in win now mode, I mean, if Andy Pajes just, you know, crushes a few homers a week in his first few weeks in the bigs, they're not putting them anywhere but in the lineup. They'll figure it out. You know, they'll make space for a guy like this, especially when, yes, the lineup hasn't been as deep as they anticipated, at least in the first few weeks of the season. On that topic, Michael Bush was traded away this off season. And we'll see how it works out on the Dodgers side. That included Jackson Ferris going the other way. And, and both guys, I'm, maybe you guys can help me. I'm forgetting the name right right from the uh, top here, but who, who else went across in that trade? Zaire, Zaire Hope. Zaire Hope. And I yeah. think both of them were off to good starts this season yeah. um, in the minors. Okay, fine. But Michael Bush is off to a nice start in the majors. He's homered in five consecutive games. I think he has six on the season. He's just been a perfect fit for the Cubs so far and was big in a win for them in extras last night. So our old friend Kyle Glazer said that for years we had an inside joke at BA about hashtag free Michael Bush. He was blocked in LA and needed a trade to get everyday ABs and show what he could do. He got his freedom and now his ability is out in the open for all to see. So, JJ, what do you think about his success so far? And I had read something about the Dodgers being concerned about how he'd handle, you know, high velocity. He had maybe some struggles, you know, numbers-wise against, you know, pitch at fastballs that were in the upper 90s. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not tracking every pitch that he's hit so far, but I think he's hitting everything. I think that the, the key thing for me with Bush is what Chicago has been able to do that Los Angeles was never going to be able to do is let him move down the defensive spectrum. I know he was drafted as a second baseman. He wasn't going to ever be really a second baseman, especially in the post shift rules, you know, ban wor you know, world. They tried him at third. He's not really a third baseman. The Cubs are allowing him to just be a first baseman. Don't worry about trying to be more than you are defensively. Just go out there and hit. And, and that's something where if you're Los Angeles, understandably, they couldn't do that. They have Freddie Freeman. He's not going to move, move Freddie Freeman aside. But with Chicago, that's, I, I think, for him, the key is is getting regular at bats and getting regular at bats at a position where he's not having to try to do something that's a little bit beyond his ability. Frees him up to be the best Michael Bush he can be. Yeah, I'm loving it right now. It's a great story. Um, so we'll keep watching Michael Bush do his thing in the bigs. Ben, great to have you on again. Uh, appreciate the time, man. And we'll catch you on another episode of Hot Sheet. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to you guys soon. Okay. Thank you. And um, it is time for Helium Spot. We're going to lock in on a very, very top end college prospect. So let's do that. Yes. Nice. Hot air balloon time. So for help, of course, Baseball America's Carlos Colazo is swinging by right now. Um, let's get some help on Wake Forest's Nick Kurtz. This is five good minutes on Nick Kurtz right now. Carlos, good to see you again. What are you observing from the uh, Wake Forest power bat right now? Yeah, what's up, guys? How's it going? Uh, we're seeing a ton of power from Nick Kurtz and really more of the hitter we expected him to be this year. He entered the year as the number two prospect on our draft board. I think the combination of just his advanced pure hitting ability and that raw power um, made him a really compelling prospect. He started out a little bit slow. If you're just looking at the back of the baseball card numbers, we can talk about why maybe that's a little bit deceptive. I think he, he had better at bats than you might expect early on in the season, uh, but he's been on an absolute home run rampage in the last two weeks or so. 
Uh, he had a six or seven game home run streak. It's just tons of power. He's hitting the ball in the air more often now at Wake Forest, which is a great combination when you're playing at a field like that, that is such a hitter friendly park. Uh, and I think he's re-entering that top of the draft conversation. I think there's a pretty muddled group of eight or nine players and Kurtz is certainly pushing himself up the board again uh, with this absurd streak he's been on lately. Carlos, kind of with this, I mean, we've seen it from him. We're seeing it from Charlie Condon. We're seeing it from Travis Bazana. We're seeing guys having just outlandish power seasons this year. Is he doing enough to kind of really put himself back in that top of the discussion? Or does the fact that we have so many guys hitting for who, who may get 25, 30 homers this year, even muddy it a little further, kind of differentiating between these different power bats, these big college bats who, who thankfully, again, we came into the season worrying about this. We thankfully do have a number of guys who really are going out there and performing. Yeah, I don't know if necessarily the the power, the power numbers we're seeing from other players is what will limit him. I think ultimately what's going to limit him in these conversations, the nitpicks you can have with Kurtz is the fact that he's first base only more than likely. That's where he's played. He is a plus defender at the position. I'm not sure how much you, you get excited about a plus defender at a position like first base, but he's quite good there. Uh, and then he's also dealt with injuries. I mean, the shoulder injury that allowed him to miss a few games earlier this season. He's had rib injuries in the past. He is a guy that does have a little bit of a medical track record. And when you're looking at that compared to a guy like Charlie Condon or Travis Bazana, who have a chance to play either up the middle, like Travis Bazana at second base, or at least a corner outfield position, and maybe even third with Charlie Condon. I think those are the two elements that are maybe the separators when you're looking at a guy like Kurtz, if you're not really sold on him in the absolute very top of the draft. But I think where maybe Kurtz can separate himself from some of these other power hitters is his track record and pure hitting ability. There are some guys in the country. Jack Caglione is a very prominent power hitter. He swings and misses a lot more. The, the swing decisions in the zone are a lot more crude. Nick Kurtz has always been a guy who has elite swing decisions in zone. He uses the entire field. He's consistently walked more than he's struck out. Um, so if you really think that hitting is ultimately the most important thing you can do as a, as a position player, and, and I think that's true, you could easily make a compelling case for Kurtz to be up there. At the same time, Charlie Condon, Travis Bazzano, those guys are probably plus hitters at this stage as well. They just offer a little bit more on the on the glove side of things. I saw that Ben Badler put up a poll and just kind of simply asked Nick Kurtz or Jack Cags, and Cags won. I mean, what was it, fifty nine to forty one? So actually, pretty convincing, convincingly. Where would you guys have voted as of right now in terms of what he'll look like in the big leagues? Not obviously what they're doing right now in, in college ball or this season projecting. If I could jump in on this one, the thing that stands out to me is, is what makes Cagley his own so fascinating in college baseball is something that unfortunately doesn't really help him probably that much as a pro, which is, is he's a true legit prospect as a hitter and as a position player. But other than Shoei Otani, we've yet to see, the guy who's shown that he can actually pull that off in pro ball. And I don't think he's Shoei Otani, nothing against Jack. But if he's just purely, if we're talking about purely as a hitter, I, I probably do think that Kurtz has a little bit more hit ability to go with that power. Um, you know, kind of what Carlos said. Okay. Yeah, we actually had this conversation on the podcast. I think both me and Ben, if you just isolate Jack as a hitter, which obviously takes a lot of his value out of, out of, as a prospect off the table. But I, I think in terms of pure hitting ability, Nick Kurtz, is more advanced at this stage. The interesting question with the two-way factor is, even if you don't think he's a two-way player in pro ball, how much better is he going to be as a hitter when he doesn't have to focus on pitching, when he can just focus on his offensive approach? If you really want to be high on Jack Caglione, you could say that maybe he has a full grade of power better, uh, raw power, than Nick Kurtz. So if you're really shooting for upside, dreaming on the improvements and adjustments he can make as a hitter when he just has to focus on one, and I think it really is important to, to just talk about how difficult it is to do uh, the two-way thing, even at the college level, it's not the majors, but it's still difficult. It still requires a lot of time. There are some scouts who are going to get really aggressive with how they're projecting the hit tool, even if Nick Kurtz right now is probably the better pure hitter. Okay, so let's finish the show by swinging it back to a big league prospect that we're not going to spend the 10 minutes on like we did with Andy Pajes and with Jack Leiter, but I would like to point out Farce Whitley getting called up. Uh, still in the top 30 for the Houston Astros at one point was a top pitching prospect in this sport and Chandler Rome reporting on Whitley kind of making it back up here and, and finally to the show getting his first call after a ton of injuries throughout the last several seasons he's going to work as a reliever 
for a bullpen that needed a fresh arm. This coming from Chandler Rome. I mean, I'm happy to see this because it's been a long time coming for him, JJ. So on a personal level for a guy to finally make it. But I said this on foul territory. I remember, and I believe it was the fall. Like I'll have to look later on where I called a game of his. And I, it might've been like a fall stars or it, it was a game where he only pitched an inning or two. And you were like, whoa, this guy's ready soon. And that was like four or five years ago, at least. So this stuff happens all the time. It's it's a, it's something where if you'd have told me in 2017 or 2018 that uh, and I, I I mean that that we would wait this long that that Forrest Whitley would not be a solid reliever solid starter I should say in in the big leagues I would have said well what I would basically probably say well injuries probably cropped up right and that's been a big part of it but he has really also kind of taken a step back he has struggled to be I don't think right now that he's as good as he was in 2017 2018. But it is good to see him get to the big leagues. Uh, being on the 40-man is a very useful thing in a time where a uh, you know uh, the Astros pitching staff is in desperate need of, of fresh arms. He is a relatively fresh arm. I am a little concerned. He's just still transitioning to a relief role, and he's kind of been on a one-inning-every-three-day schedule in the minors. If he's up for longer than just a, a quick up and down, that's kind of not the normal uh, usage patterns in the big leagues. So he's going to have to kind of do a little bit of on the job learning, but I, I think more than anything, he's a fresh arm. They need that. And I don't want to make it sound like that he's sitting there and he's lobbing it up at 88, 90 or anything. He's still 97, you know, 96, 97. I think you'll even maybe see an eight out of him just isn't missing as many bats as he used to. And the, the secondaries aren't as sharp as they were, but again, he's now a big leaguer. It is very cool to see that. And hopefully this gives him a chance to kind of build on that and kind of put a lot of these uh, setbacks, a lot of these injuries behind him. Yeah, 26 years old, making it up to the show. Carlos, do you remember seeing him a while back and thinking, damn, and this guy has potential to be, you know, a one or a two in the big leagues? Yeah, when he was a prospect coming out of high school, that would have been even before my time at BA. That's how long it's been. But I do remember just seeing the, the caliber of prospect he was, reading reading BA and, and being so excited about him. And I think it really speaks to the risk that you have with the high school pitching demographic. It's it's maybe one of the scariest demographics for teams in the draft. We saw just one high school right-handed pitcher taken in the first round a year ago. Um, but I think it's cool just to see him finally make this. It's been a long path for him. Excited to see the adjustments he's able to make as a reliever, if he can kind of hone in some of this command, uh, get the secondaries a little bit more crisp. But cool to see him finally make it, and we'll see what he's able to do. Good day for prospect call-ups. So thanks for watching, Hachi, to everyone. Please you know, like, subscribe this video, uh, the Baseball America YouTube channel that you're sitting on right now to watch this, or if you're listening, Apple, Spotify, rate, review, you know what to do. Uh, this is a cool day for us to be able to do a show. We'll have individual segments on the profiles that we did with uh, Andy Pajes and Jack Leiter. So, JJ, enjoy those debuts, right? Let's have fun right. and kick back. It'll be and a fun month. Yeah, it will. Carlos, thank you as always. Good to see you, man. See you guys. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching Hot Sheet or listening. See you next week.